What we're looking at now is the Equifax Consumer Credit Report. This is the report that, as a mortgage professional, you will be obtaining on your client. This particular report is a sample of potential information found in an Equifax credit report. It's not an actual credit report, but one that Equifax uses for training purposes. So the first thing I'd like to point out is number one, uh, the consumer report. Number one, the consumer report is the phone number that you're going to provide to your consumer if they have been declined credit. So for example, if they go through you and for some reason due to their credit report they're unable to obtain financing, this is the number you're going to give them to contact Equifax. Now quite frankly, in most cases the consumer can go online, fill out an online uh, report uh, requesting information be removed or updated, but whatever the issue here it's important to note that you cannot give a copy of this credit report to your client. You have to advise them that for any discrepancies they must contact Equifax and obtain a copy themselves. Number two here is the date that the file was accessed. We start with the month followed by the day and the year. So that if down the road you want to come back and take a look at this, or if your lender is looking at this to determine when the file was accessed, in other words, how relevant this credit report is when it was last pulled, this is where you'll be looking. So number two is the date that the file was accessed. Number three is the inquiry data. So when you take an application on a client, you fill it out using Phylogix Expert, and then you pull a credit report using Phylogix Expert, which if you're not familiar with that, that is the uh, electronic application that you're going to be using uh, to process your client. And in that application, there's an option to pull the credit report. So based on the information that's in this application, that's what Equifax uses to obtain this credit report. You can now look at this and see everything that you've inputted or Equifax has used to obtain this specific report. We start off with uh, an identification number, reference number. Those are, are specifically for Equifax. We see the name of the individual. Uh, so in this case, it's uh, test, comma, file, comma, P. So it test would be last name, uh, file would be the first name, P would be the middle initial. Current address, 110 Shepherd Avenue, North York, Ontario, and the postal code. We then look at uh, the previous address. So this is an address that you've inputted into the application and the date of birth as you've inputted it into this application. It also includes the social insurance number if you inputted the correct social insurance number. So because apparently we didn't input the correct social insurance number, it's not going to tell us what the social insurance number is of the borrower. This is another way to protect the borrower's identity. It also shows us that for the occupation of the uh, borrower, we've put in owner tests hair salon. So this is the information we've given to Equifax. Moving on, we see in section four, we see the subject. It tell, this section here tells us the information uh, that is populated and displayed in the rest of this file. So in this particular case, we see there's going to be an alert, the score, identification, inquiries, employment, a summary, public, trades, banking, and declaration. And as we go through this, we'll break down each one of these sections so you have an understanding of what they all mean. So scrolling down a little bit here, we see that, there we go, we see that under the consumer alert for subject one, and when going back to number four, it's subject one. If there were two people that we were pulling the report on, in other words, if this was a joint file, we'd have subject one and subject two. In this case, there's only the individual, so the consumer alert is on subject one. So we see in number five, uh, warnings. And in this particular case, this is any information that was inputted uh, that doesn't match the file or if it's invalid. 
So in this partic particular case, we see that we have an invalid social insurance number, which means that the number that you inputted in the file when it was submitted to Equifax to obtain this credit report, Equifax determined that the social insurance number was incorrect. To ensure that you're dealing with the proper individual, it's always important when you see a warning like this to obtain documentation that supports the information that you were given. I would suggest that you go back, take a look at your application, take a look at your notes. Perhaps you simply inputted uh, or made an error on inputting the social insurance number. Whatever the case is, make sure that uh, you do obtain the correct information. Number six is a safe scan warning. This is a fraud alert message that warns you of potential application fraud. Now this is uh, a subscription service, so it's only available to safe scan subs subscribers. What this means is that in this particular case, it's possible there is true name fraud. What that means to us is that we have to verify all information. It's possible true name fraud, not necessarily true name fraud. So it's always in our best interest to obtain photo identification wherever possible, make a copy of that and include it in our file. Where you're meeting a client at their home or outside of your office, in other words, another place that a place that doesn't have a photocopier, what you can do is use a camera phone, for example, take a picture of the individual's uh, photo ID, print that off, and leave that in your file. Number seven, uh, these are the scores and reason codes. This is a risk score that accompanies by accompanied by up to four reason codes, and they appear in this section. Reason codes indicate the main reasons for the score, and this is again a subscription service, and it's available only to risk score subscribers. So for Equifax, the risk score is called a beacon score. In this case, we see that the risk score is a 509. In looking back uh, or learning about beacon scores, you'll know that they range anywhere from a low of 300 to a high of approximately 900. The lower number here is an indication of derogatory or bad credit. The higher the number, the better the individual's credit. So in this particular case, we have four risk score reason codes, and we start off with a serious delinquency in public record or collection filed. We'll see that in a little while in that section. Time since delinquency is too recent or unknown. We'll see what that means as well. Number of, of accounts with delinquency and length of time revolving accounts have been established are two other reason codes. And in un, of themselves, they don't explain very much. But what they do indicate is that there is some other information in this report that we need to look at that uh, supports the reason for this risk score being so low. So we'll continue down. We uh, look at this next indicator. And this is the bank nav index. And there are four reasons here as well. This is also for uh, risk score subscribers. Some lenders out there will look at this score and determine if a borrower qualifies based on this score. Same thing here. We're looking at age of derogatory public records, average age of retail trades, number of recent inquiries, and average age of trades, all of which we'll take a look at in a few minutes. A little bit farther down, we see the section entitled Identification of Subject 1. So in Section 8, we're looking at the unique number here. This unique number, whoops, this unique number is used by Equifax for internal identification purposes only. So we don't have to worry about that, but if you were dealing with Equifax uh, and you were contacting them, they may ask you to quote the unique number of the file that uh, is in question. The file number, number 9, is also for Equifax internal use only. And again, they may ask you to quote this file number if you're talking to somebody at Equifax about this particular file. Number 10 is the date the file was established. A file is typically established when someone first applies for credit. So under that assumption, 
we can look at this and we can say that the first time that this person applied for credit was in January 23rd, 1975. Then we flip over to number 11, the date of last activity. That means the date that the last time something was updated or changed on this file. So in this case, we see that it was June 3rd, 2004. Both of those numbers are important to us uh, because the date the file opened will indicate how long this file has been opened, which means to us if we're looking at somebody with new credit, it'll tell us how long this file has been opened and do they have uh, substantial credit. And if they don't, and the file has been open for a while, that may cause us to ask a couple of questions. One of the questions we may ask if we see that the date the file was opened was in 1975 and, for example, they have no credit, uh, was did they go bankrupt? Well, that might not necessarily be important if there's no other indication because it's been a significant amount of time since they've been bankrupt. Uh, it might be helpful for us to know what the circumstances were around the bankruptcy. So that might be a bit of a tip-off that the individual has gone bankrupt. In number 12, we see either the date of birth or the age of the subject. In this particular case, we know that it's the date of birth, and his date of birth is February 16th, 1942. That is something else that you should be verifying with photo identification. In number 13, we see the social insurance number. It's important to note, as I mentioned earlier, that this will only display here if you provided it correctly when you submitted the request for this report. So if we input an improper social insurance number, the file will not come back with the borrower's social insurance number for privacy reasons. Then we see in section 14, the subject name, section 15, the current address of the subject, and again, this information needs to be verified. Question being, how can you verify a person's current address? And that's a good question. What you can do is obtain a letter that was sent by a utility. It can confirm that the individual's name and address match what we see here and what we were told by the borrower. In number 16, we see since. This is the date the address was reported and added to the Equifax report. ROB indicates if the subject rents, owns, or boards their current address if this is known. And in this particular case, we don't know. There's no indication here, but we know that it was since 01-2003. In 17, we're looking at reported. And the STS reported stands for direct link customer. And this isn't really, a, I mean, this indicates the type of customer that reported the address information. So this isn't something that we have to be concerned about. This is how did Equifax obtain this information. In 18, we look at the same type of information that we just looked at, except this is for the former address. So under the former address, we see 1231 15th Avenue, Calgary, Alberta, with the postal code. Since 01-2003. And reported, it was reported to Equifax by tape. Again, that's uh, not important to us, uh, but this is indicates that it's a monthly tape reporting customer. In section 19, we look at the second former address. And this was 2314 11th Avenue, Suite 1201 in Toronto, Ontario, with the postal code. This is since 01 2003. Now, these are the times that it was uh, reported to Equifax and it was verbally reported. Again, by uh, that's not important to us. However, that's how it was reported to Equifax. Number 20. Here is where we see an AKA, or also known as. Because this individual has gone by another name or had 
credit given or granted or had an inquiry done under another name that's been uh, cross-referenced to this individual, this credit report will contain the information under both the name information that we've given uh, and under the also know it as. Going down a little bit further, we see inquiries. Under the inquiry section, basically we're looking at uh, section 21 here. An alert message appears if there have been three or more inquiries in the past 90 days. That's to give uh, the individual pulling this credit report and those making decisions on whether to lend, that gives them an idea if this individual is a credit seeker. In other words, are they applying for a lot of credit in a short period of time? That's a potential red flag for financial instability. It's not necessarily indicative of financial instability. However, it's potential. So we're going to take a closer look at this individual's credit and their income. In section 22, we have the date, member number, and member name for inquiries in the past 36 months. Member phone numbers display for the inquiries in the past 12 months. So this gives us an idea over the past three years, how often and who has this borrower applied to credit for. In section 23, we see the total number of inquiries since the file was established. Now in this particular case, we know the file was established since 1975 and all of these credit inquiries were made since 2002, which tends to make sense. In section 24, this is if there is a foreign bureau, then the date, the member number, and the name of the U.S. inquiring customer. So we take a look at this and we see that on June 2nd, 2002, and then we have the member number here, and the fact is that they made an inquiry uh, through a TDGM visa. So that's a foreign bureau. Scrolling down a little bit farther, we see the employment section. We start off with section 25, which is the current employer. So the current employer is Tess Hair Salon. In section 26, the since left position salary, this is the occupation of the subject and when it was verified, the start date, the left date, and the salary. Now in this particular case, that information isn't available except the position. So when you look at the first comma, there is no since, the second comma, there is no left. Then we have under position, owner, and then no salary after that. So this is all that we have on the individual's current employment. And it appears that this individual is self-employed. So it's necessary, depending on the lender and the product and the loan to value and so on, that we get adequate documentation to support this. Section 27 is former employer. This is showing us the company name of the previous employer, the since left position and salary, uh, occupa occupation of subject and when verified start date, left date, and salary. So we look at this information and we can see here that uh, apparently our client worked for um, the Hilton Hotel and was a hairstylist. Again, no other information. Then 28, the second former employer, which is his employer before, his last employer. Disney Cruise Line, uh, Toronto, Ontario, since left position salary. And we have that information there. And we also see that it was verified on uh, February 2001. What we can see from this, as a bit of an aside, is that this individual worked as a hairstylist early on in his career, then became uh, a hairstylist with Disney Cruise Line, and then apparently opened his own salon. So when we're talking to a lender, there is good continuity of employment here in the same field. Section 29, we're looking at the summary section. So we'll scroll down here a little bit. Uh, we see that it provides a synopsis of the file items that we're going to go through momentarily. 
Uh, we're looking at pub other, meaning the number of public record or other information found in the public record section. Uh, trade, oldest to newest, the total, the high credit, and, and the rating of the trade lines. R stands for revolving. I is an installment account, O is an open account, M is a mortgage account, and C is a line of credit. So as we go through this information, you'll see and that, that'll make a little bit more sense. Now we see here under pub other there are four. That's telling us that there are four items of public records or other information showing on this file. Then we see the trade, the oldest to the newest. 01-2001 indicates that's the oldest or when the borrower first obtained credit. 06-2004 is the newest indication of credit or when the last item was updated. Total, we're told that there are three trade lines. The high credit ranges from $2,800 to $28,000. And the rating, this is again a summary of what we're going to be taking a look at. There's one, 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 two, and one other that will make sense momentarily. So, under the public records or other information, this section shows information obtained from public sources. So, we look under 31 information from bankruptcy superintendent. This is a public source. And this is a person that's uh, legally declared to be unable to pay debt. So th this is a bankruptcy. What it shows is uh, the date file, the type of action. IND for personal, BUS stands for business. And in this case, the type is individual. The court name, the court code, uh, those aren't too important to us. But what is important, um, to a degree, is the amount of liabilities and assets. So we show liabilities were 28000 assets were listed at $480. This was uh, filed by the subject. Then we see the case number, the disposition of the bankruptcy, and the description of the bankruptcy. So the disposition shows us that it was discharged in 10 2000 and the description of that disposition is that it was an absolute discharge. So typically when we take a look at this we see that it was filed in 01 2000. That's January 2000. A uh, good rule of thumb is that for a first bankruptcy you typically are discharged automatically nine months after that. So that makes sense. So for us we can take a look at this and we can determine with some certainty that this was our borrower's first bankruptcy. They went bankrupt in uh, January 2000 and were discharged in October of 2000. Scrolling down a little bit further in section 32, some more public information, we see uh, third-party collections. This is a debt which a creditor is unable to collect and hires a third party such as a collection agency uh, to do so. So in this case we see the name of the third-party collection agency, uh, the collection agency member number, reported date, type of, collection, type of collection, uh, UPCL stands for unpaid collection, uh, or PD stands for paid collection, and in this case it's just printed out, unpaid. We see the amount outstanding is $482. Sorry, that was the original amount, 482 The date of the last activity was January 2002, and the outstanding balance is still $482. And the reason for this is unknown. There's a ledger number, the date that it was verified, the creditor, in other words, who uh, filed this collection, and a description. And in this particular case, the subject disputes this account. What we would need to do here is ask for verification from the borrower with regards to this dispute. Is there something that the borrower can show us that shows this is a, a, a legitimate dispute? And if there is, quite frankly, the borrower should have this cleared up by uh, Equifax or pay the collection. 
doing nothing does not help this borrower. The next item that we see here is a secured loan. A secured loan can be a chattel mortgage registered loan or registered lien and this is where the debtor is given personal property as collateral and the loan is registered with the provincial government. It's important to note that while this is under the public records section, this is not necessarily derogatory information. This simply means that we have a secured loan. And in this particular case, it shows the date filed, the court name, the court number, when it matures. So based on the time that we're pulling this credit report, it's before December 2004, uh, based on the sample report. So that we could tell that it would be up for uh, maturity or to be paid off uh, very shortly. The creditor and the amount, it shows a superior credit with the address, and it shows us the amount. And then it shows under description security to disposition unknown. So the Equifax uh, is not certain of uh, the disposition, and that might be something we also need to verify. In section 34, we see a piece of information that is potentially derogatory information. And this is where a court order against uh, the debtor or our borrower for payment of monies owing. We see this starting off with the date the judgment was granted or filed, the judgment status, uh, and in this particular case, um, we're not sh seeing any status here and there's no date verified. But if there was a status, it would be STJD, which stands for Satisfied Judgment, or JDGT, which is just Judgment. Uh, we see the defendant is test file, the case number, the plaintiff, and a description. These types of information we need explanations on for our lender. So in this particular case, you would want to know, is this uh, disposition, what is the disposition? Has this been, this been paid? Because obviously TransCanada Credit obtained a judgment against our borrower in 2002, which is approximately two years prior to our borrower coming to us for a mortgage. So we need to know if this has been paid off. Absolutely, the lender will want to know if this has been paid off and uh, most likely will not grant a mortgage if there is still an outstanding balance in a judgment. Section 35, we get into the trade information of our subject. And what we see here is the member trades. What this tells us is in the first column, you know, these are the trade lines. In other words, this is credit that is, has been reported to Equifax. We see business ID code, and that is the company name and or telephone number and or customer number. We see RPTD, which is the date the item was reported to Equifax. OPND stands for opened. When was this first granted to our borrower? And we see it was April of 2001. HC stands for high credit on the account. This is the highest amount owed or the credit limit. So if it's going to be the credit limit, it will tell us that in the description. But in this particular case, this was the outstanding balance when it was first granted. We can see that the terms are, and these are monthly repayment terms, $555 a month. As of the date that it was reported, we're being told that there's an outstanding balance of $4,200. And then we see PDA. It's never good to see a number under the PDA. This is the past due amount as of the date reported. Now we can look at this and see there are terms, $555 a month, and the PDA is $555. So guess what? This borrower is behind one payment. That brings us to the RT. The RT is basically the rating. And this is uh, a North American standard rating system that's used. In this particular case, we see the, that it's an I-2. I stands for an installment, and 2 indicates that it's one month behind. Now we're going to take a look 
a little later on at all of these codes, they range basically from uh, a 1 to a 9. So it could be I1, I2, and so on, up to a 9. We'll take a look at what those codes mean uh, in a few moments. The next column, 30, 60, 90, that column is telling us how many times the subject has been 30, 60, or 90 days past due with this specific account. We can see that our poor test file subject here has been behind four times 30 days, three times 60 days, and one time 90 days. And under the MR, that's months reviewed. In other words, the number of times or months this, is, this account's been reported to Equifax, and it's 21 times. DLA is date of last activity. This is the date of the last activity with this account. It could be the purchase date, the last payment date, uh, or in a worst case scenario, the write-off write date. We then see that the next line here is account. That is the account number and then description. Uh, we're looking at, this is any additional information uh, about the account. So we see here that it's a personal loan. And we knew that already from the I, which is an installment. And it has semi-monthly payments. So we couldn't tell that before, but we can tell that now. And one thing that I skipped over, previous high rates, if we look at the previous high rates, it'll tell us uh, basically the in, it'll indicate uh, in the three of the most recent delinquencies. So we have an I3, which is two months derogatory or late in 07, 2002, an I4, which is three months late in 06, 2002, and an I5 being four months late in 02, 2002. So again, this borrower hasn't had much luck with this CIBC loan, at least when it comes to making their payments. The next account is Zeller's, so we can see their business and ID code. It was reported 01-2001, and it was opened 06-2004. Now, that's obviously an error. So we would have to talk about this with the borrower, and it would be in their best interest to contact Equifax to have this corrected. Now, we would look at the rest of this information with a bit of a, a grain of salt or a conservative uh, eye, a critical eye, I should say. Under high credit, we're looking at $2,800. The terms, $26 per month. The balance, $2,555. PDA, there's nothing past due. The rating is an R1, meaning that it's currently up to date. Under 306090, there is nothing there, so he has not missed any payments on this. And we see that the months reported is 16. Now, going back to that reported and opened, I would assume that that is simply backwards, that since the reported date of the CIBC was 06-2004, and that's when we're pulling this report, that that should be 06-2004 and the open date 01-2001. However, let's just verify that to be on the safe side. We see the DLA, the date of last activity, being 05-2004, and the account number and the description, the amount in the HC column is the credit limit. So unlike the CIBC loan, where we had a $28,000 initial opening balance, and it's been paid down to $4,200 since then, under the Zeller's credit card, and we know this because for an R1 rating, that R stands for revolving. So unlike the CIBC loan, where it's installments, on the revolving, that's where you have a credit limit that can be utilized, you make payments, you drop down, the outstanding balance and you can still access that additional credit. So that's revolving. In this description, the amount in the HC column, as mentioned, is the credit limit. So we have a $2,800 credit limit and those $26 payments under the terms are monthly payments. Looking down a little bit further on TD Visa, we have a contact number, the business ID, 
and the last time it was reported was June 2004, status is lost or stolen card. This is what it would look like if the borrower had report, reported this card as lost or stolen. We see the only other information here is that it was reported 30, 60, or 90, zero times for each. Section 36. Now that we've looked at the trade lines, we've got some statistics for us. The credit utilization line provides the percentage that the customers utilize their credit by dividing balances by high credit. The total of all open high credit amounts and all open account balances are also displayed. So we have 22% as the credit utilization and $30,800 was the high credit and sixty-seven fifty-five being the current outstanding balances. As we go a little bit further down to section 37 here, this is a section that you're typically not going to find on a credit report. Uh, this is indicated, it's shown here and explained in case you do see it, but for most individuals, this information is not included in their credit report. This is number 37, the banking information section. This gives the type of account, the name and telephone number of the institution, the date the item was reported to Equifax, the type of account, the customer's member number, the date the account was opened with the credit grantor, the balance of the account, the approximate range, and additional information on the account. Um, in this particular case, we've already got a feel that our poor test subject here is not doing so well financially, and now we get to see that there were four NSFs in 2002, which is unfortunate and it doesn't help our borrower at all. So that, again, is not typically in a credit report, but if it is there, it can provide some information. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, additional derogatory information. Section 38 is a consumer declaration, and this is by our subject. Uh, this indicates the date reported and the purge date. In other words, it was reported in 06-2004 and will be removed from the credit report in 06-2005. This is a statement that the consumer or subject has added to the file to explain discrepancies or other comments, uh, and it can be also added by um, the credit bureau itself. In this particular case, there is a warning. Confirmed true name fraud, fraudulent credit applications have been submitted using this name. If you access this file as part of a credit check, please verify with the customer that it is legitimate before extending credit. And phone 123456-7890. Something else that we're going to want to do is ensure that we get full photo identification as well as confirmation of their current address and all other information that we obtain from this borrower to ensure that the borrower that has come to us is actually the owner of this credit report. That brings us to the end of our investigation and interpretation of the Equifax credit report.